Hello, this is Professor Catrullis at Rio Hondo College. This video will guide you through experiment 8, in which we will cover the topics of solutions, electrolytes, and concentration over the course of four parts. In specific, what we are going to be looking at is the solubility of a selected group of compounds, or elements, based on how polar they are, that is, whether they are polar or nonpolar. We will be taking a look at the concept of electrolytes and classifying electrolytes as strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes, or non-electrolytes. We will then be going ahead and looking at the concentrations of various solutions and the terms that we use for those, which will include molarity, percent by mass, percent of mass volume, and milliequivalents per liter. And we will be using those concentration terms in separating out a mixture of what we call saturated uh, salt water. First of all, let's go ahead and take a look at the topic that will pertain most to part A of the lab, and that is polarity. So we say that a substance is polar if its molecules have a separation of charge. In other words, what we mean is that there is one part of the molecule which is going to be positively charged, or possibly even many parts of a molecule that's positively charged, and another section which is negatively charged. And so that's what we mean by saying that there is a separation in the charges. So polar substances have more electronegative atoms usually bonded to less electronegative ones. So the more electronegative atoms will be pulling the electrons towards them and give those regions of the molecules a negative charge. The atoms that they are bonded to, being less electronegative, will be deprived of electrons, and so those sections of the molecule will be more positive. When we have a nonpolar substance, what we usually see is atoms of a very similar electronegativity bonded together. So the most important example of this is carbon bonded with hydrogen, or any identical atoms bonded to each other. So for example, iodine bonded with iodine, carbon bonded to carbon, fluorine bonded to fluorine. So whenever it's the same atoms bonded to one another. We also find nonpolar substances which do have electronegative atoms bonded with uh, ones that are not as electronegative, but the molecules might be symmetrical. And what that causes is the bond dipoles to cancel out. They're being pulled in opposite directions. You've already seen examples of this earlier in the class, but we'll see an example of this again in just a moment in this video. When we think of polar compounds, water is probably our best example. We have oxygen, which has an electronegativity of 3.5, bonded to hydrogen atoms, which have an electronegativity of 2.1. So that's a pretty big difference, 3.5 to 2.1. It's not important that we memorize those values, but we should know that oxygen-hydrogen bonds are going to have a big difference in, in uh, polarity. So this means that the electrons are being pulled away from the hydrogen towards the much more electronegative oxygen. Same thing over here. What is the shape of a water molecule? You should recall from earlier in the semester that we say a water molecule is bent. Some people call that tetrahedral bent because there are four groups total here. But bent is the important shape that we should consider. So the hydrogens are positive. In fact, we could say this whole side of the water molecule is partially positively charged. And the oxygen side is partially negatively charged. We sometimes use this type of an arrow here to indicate that the molecule has what we call a dipole moment, meaning that this side here with the cross is positive, and the arrow is pointing towards the direction of the negative part of the molecule. On the other hand, let's take a look at a compound which is nonpolar called butane. Butane, you might have encountered, is commonly used in cigarette lighters as the fuel for the flame to burn. It consists of four carbon atoms bonded together, and those carbon atoms are joined to each other and joined to hydrogen atoms. 
carbon atoms have an electronegativity of 2.5 and hydrogen atoms have an electronegativity of 2.1. So the difference between 2.5 and 2.1 is only 0.4. It's a very small difference and that means that carbon and hydrogen atoms will be sharing electrons between them fairly equally. We also have carbon atoms bonded to each other and since these are identical atoms same electronegativity, the difference between them is zero. So there's essentially perfect sharing between each of these atoms here. You'll also notice if you look at the molecule, it's pretty much symmetrical. I can cut it in half down here, or I could cut it in half right through there. This is really simplifying the structure because in reality it is three dimensions. It's much more complicated than we see. But this gives us enough information to pretty much say that since it's symmetrical, oops, let's go back there, sorry about that, that even if electrons were being pulled one way or the other, uh, it would ultimately cancel out on us. Let's take a look at two compounds which might be a little bit more confusing. First of all, we have CF4, carbon tetrafluoride. Let's go ahead and look at that. We have carbon with electronegativity of 2.5 bonded to fluorine with electronegativity of 4.0. That's a big difference. Each one of those bonds are polar. However, it's a tetrahedral shape. We have all of the fluorines pulling in essentially opposite directions. It's a very symmetrical molecule. And since those electronegative atoms are pulling electrons in essentially opposite directions, that's going to cause the overall polarity of the molecule to be zero. By symmetry, we're seeing that the electrons are being pulled in opposite directions and ultimately cancel out. So CF4 is nonpolar. What about this compound here called fluoromethane? Here we still have a tetrahedral molecule. Carbon and hydrogen, as we already saw, have a very similar electronegativity. So they're going to be sharing electrons pretty much equally here. However, the fluorine is very electronegative and is pulling electrons away from this bond between carbon and fluorine. And in fact, it's almost like a giant electron vacuum cleaner pulling even these electrons towards it. And so what we see here is since the electrons are wanting to move much more towards the fluorine, that would be to the right in this picture, that in fact this molecule is polar. The negative side is over by the fluorine, where all the electrons want to hang out. And the positive side would be pretty much everything on the left, the way this has been drawn, as far as that goes. All right, so that would be a polar molecule. Now, what we're going to be interested in is whether different compounds mix or dissolve with one, in one another. We're going to use the word dissolve when we talk about putting a solid in a uh, liquid, and we're just gonna use the word mix when we talk about putting liquids with liquids. That's actually called miscibility. But for right now, let's just be simple and say that something is soluble if the parts mix and insoluble otherwise. Now, when we're talking about solubility, the most important sentence that we like to use is like dissolves like. That's a very simple guideline. Doesn't always work, but it's going to work fine for our purposes today. What this is saying is that polar compounds or elements or other substances like to dissolve in other polar compounds. On the other hand, nonpolar compounds like to dissolve in other nonpolar compounds. And in general, they don't tend to mix very well. So polar compounds mix with polar compounds, but not with nonpolar ones. What about ions? So our ionic compounds, like for example, salt, sodium chloride. Should ionic compounds be more soluble in polar or nonpolar solvents? Well, ionic compounds are probably the best example we have of a separation of charge. There can be positive ions and negative ions always mixed in with one another. So they're going to want to dissolve generally more in polar solvents because polar solvents with their positive and negative charges are better equipped to go ahead and approach and surround uh, ions.
We will now begin by looking at part A of this experiment, which deals with, not surprisingly, polarity. So in part A, you're going to compare how well some uh, four different compounds will dissolve and mix with a couple different solvents, one of them being polar and the other being nonpolar. So water is going to be our polar solvent, and cyclohexane is going to be our nonpolar one. I'm not going to put the structure of cyclohexane up because it might be a little bit confusing, but suffice it to say it has only carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds, so it's very similar to butane in terms of its polarity, so very nonpolar. And then we're going to test out four different uh, a mixture here of uh, compounds and uh, one uh, element, the element iodine. So potassium permanganate, iodine, sucrose, table sugar, and vegetable oil. In this experiment, we're going to be using a total of eight test tubes. Four test tubes on the left will be filled with DI water, and the four test tubes on the right will be filled with the nonpolar cyclohexane. Each of these test tubes contains about three milliliters of the solvent that we're interested in. Here we see the four different substances whose polarity we are going to evaluate. They are potassium permanganate, iodine, sucrose, which is table sugar, and vegetable oil. We begin with the compound potassium permanganate. You'll notice that it's a solid compound with a deep violet color. We're going to go ahead here and measure out a very, very small amount and add a few grains to the test tube on the left, which contains water. And we're going to add approximately the same amount to the test tube on the right, which contains cyclohexane, our nonpolar solvent. Next, we're going to go ahead and shake each of the test tubes. So you'll notice that the water immediately takes on a very deep purple color, just like the solid itself. However, when we shake the test tube containing cyclohexane, no real change is observed. If we go ahead and we look at the bottom of the test tube, you'll notice that, in fact, the solid potassium permanganate is still left in the bottom of the test tube. Now we move on to iodine. Iodine, just like potassium permanganate, has a deep purple color. But you'll notice the crystals do look uh, quite a bit different in structure. As before, on the left test tube, we have the solvent water. And then in the test tube on the right, we have the cyclohexane. And we're going to add approximately the same amount to each test tube. Shaking the test tube on the left with iodine and water does produce a slight change. You'll notice if you look very, very carefully that the water is just slightly discolored, a little uh, yellowish or brownish, but most of the solid remains at the bottom of the test tube. On the other hand, when we shake the iodine in cyclohexane, it takes on a deep purplish color, just like the solid iodine had. If we look very carefully, it will appear that virtually all of the solid iodine has dissolved. Now we move to sucrose. Again, that's table sugar. I'm assuming you have all seen table sugar, so it shouldn't be too much of a surprise to you to see that it is a white solid. Now, 
This one will be just a little bit more difficult to uh, visualize because white solids tend to give uh, colorless solutions. So what we're going to have to look for here is uh, whether or not uh, the solid remains dissolved or if it just goes to the bottom of the test tube in the salt. So the test tube on the left contains water now with the sucrose in it. We'll shake that. And now we'll give it a really good shake, just to make sure. And you'll notice, if you look towards the bottom of the test tube, that virtually all of the solid is gone. It has dissolved. Doing the same with the cyclohexane, you'll notice that there was some solid there in the bottom of the tube. And now give it some really good agitation. And if you look at the bottom, there still seems to be some solid. Well, whatever we did with, for the water, we really need to do uh, for the cyclohexane. So again, we're going to give it a really good shaking, uh, agitating there. To see if that helps. And not really. If you notice very carefully, the solid sucrose still remains in the bottom of the test tube. Finally, we have vegetable oil. You should be able to predict the results of this one quite well yourself, considering you all know that oil and water are supposedly not uh, going to mix. But with this being a liquid, uh, we have to test it a little bit differently. We're not looking for what we call solubility here, so much as what we call miscibility. Will the liquids mix? If liquids mix, then you should not see a distinct layer between them. You should just see one layer that looks essentially the same all the way throughout. So we add the vegetable oil on the left to the water, and then we've just done it to the right with the cyclohexane. And again, giving it a real good shake. So the vegetable oil in the water, you'll notice that there's lots of little bubbles. Uh, and that's the vegetable oil not mixing with the water. And it forms a layer on the top. When liquids don't mix, you will always get two different layers. The layer on the top will be the less dense of the liquid, and the layer on the bottom will be the more dense of the two liquids. Now agitating the vegetable oil in cyclohexane, we'll notice it has a considerably different uh, kind of a texture and a behavior than it did for water. You don't see any tiny bubbles, you don't see two layers. It's one nice homogeneous solution. Everything is completely mixed in.